Good evening. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second in a series of fascinating and thought-provoking lectures from distinguished experts on themes related to sustainability. Sustainability is a thematic priority at EPFL for teaching and research, as well as for campus operations, as detailed in the Climate and Sustainability Strategy published in early 2023. In this context, the EPFL launched the Sustainability Lecture Series in March of this year to raise awareness and encourage debate, dialogue, and deep thinking on this crucial topic. Another thematic priority for EPFL is mental health, both in terms of research and in terms of caring for our own community. On the research side, we recently inaugurated the Synapse Center for Neuroscience and Mental Health Research, which integrates all mental health-related research at EPFL and serves as a central node to connect researchers, students, interested stakeholders, and the public at large with the mission to promote mental health research and to raise awareness at EPFL and beyond. The mental health of the EPFL community is also of great importance. The Task Force on Mental Health and Wellbeing at EPFL was created in early 2022 to propose and develop concrete strategies to support and improve the well-being of the EPFL community, based on an in-depth analysis of the needs of its members, and to elaborate an institutional strategy on mental health. Since its creation, the task force has organized the first Mental Health Week at EPFL, with lectures, roundtable discussions, workshops, and well-being survey of the entire EPFL community. The report on the results will soon be presented to the EPFL direction, after which it will be released to the public. Working groups are already in place, developing measures to implement in order to palliate the problems revealed by the survey. Tonight's distinguished speaker, whom it is a great pleasure and a great honor to welcome to EPFL, has made remarkable contributions that concern both of these thematic priorities, and that, as a researcher in neuroscience, I find particularly intriguing. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Anne-Christine Duhaime, a pediatric neurosurgeon who received her medical degree from the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She served as Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital until May 2021, and is the Nicholas T. Zervas Distinguished Professor of Neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. She's been a practicing board-certified pediatric neurosurgeon for three decades, with experience in all aspects of pediatric neurosurgical practice. She also serves as a consultant for the child protection team at Massachusetts General Hospital and has served on the American Board of Pediatric Neurological Surgery and the editorial board of the Journal of Neurosurgery. Her neuroscience research focuses on the mechanisms, pathophysiology, imaging, and treatment of injury in the immature brain using translational and clinical research to study injuries occurring in infants and young children, including those seen most commonly in child abuse. She also studies plasticity, recovery, and return of function in children and adolescents of different ages. Dr. Duhame has long been interested in the relationships among brain function, behavior, plasticity, and environmental issues. Beginning with a fellowship at the Radcliffe Institute in 2016, she's explored the neurobiology of reward circuitry and plasticity and its relevance to pro-environmental behavior and also worked with a diverse team to design a prototype advanced green biophilic pediatric hospital. In addition to being a faculty associate at the Harvard University Center for the Environment, she serves as associate director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for the Environment and Health and is associate editor-in-chief of the Journal of Climate Change and Health. Dr. Duhame recently published a book on the work she's done at the interface of neuroscience and sustainability called Minding the Climate, How Neuroscience Can Help Solve Our Environmental Crisis, which explores the question, why can't we do what we need to do to stop destroying the planet while we still have a chance? I look forward very much to hearing Dr. Duhame's answers to this question and her proposals for fighting our innate tendencies not to take action in time during our lecture. Dr. Duhem, thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Hess, and thank you for coming tonight and uh, participating in this discussion. I wish I had the answer. Uh, I don't have the answer. But I do feel that we can get closer to an answer by the kind of interdisciplinary work that is done here at EPFL and other major learning institutions and educational institutions around the world. So I hope that 
in tonight's presentation and dialogue, I learn from you, as well as having direction in the other uh, dimension. What could possibly be the link between climate change and the human brain? And how can this help us find effective solutions? In my world, we think everything is about the brain, because that's our job. And each of you has your own set of experiences, your own set of knowledge, and when you think of a problem as immense and complicated as climate change, each specialty, each discipline, each life experience has something to bring to this problem. In my experience, I deal with brains every day, and I think that you can't understand any problem that humans have caused and continue to create without understanding what is the equipment that they use to make decisions, to have done the things that they've done throughout history that have gotten us to this point. So I wanna thank you for this opportunity to come here to this beautiful and exciting campus. Uh, and I also wanna thank you for the opportunity to understand a little bit about the culture of your institution with these wonderful values of equality and diversity, respect and sustainability. Who could ask for anything more in an institution of higher learning? So what we'll cover in this talk, oh warning, there will be pictures of brains and brain surgery. So if you are squeamish, um, close your eyes as soon as you see it. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anything really terrible, but this is, this is my life and uh, to share the story, uh, some of this will be relevant. I'm not showing it for shock value, but for us, it, it doesn't shock us, but if you're sensitive, uh, I just am giving you a warning. And what we're gonna cover is an overview um, of climate change and environmental decline, which will be very familiar to most of you, but just so that we're all using the words the same way. We'll talk briefly about the neural origins, that is, how did we get to be the way we are? How did our brains get to this point through evolution? For what tasks did our brains evolve? And what specifically is the role of the human reward system in decision making? We'll talk briefly, but can talk more in the discussion about how has modern life in the 21st century changed the way our brains work and what influences them such that our consumption and that increase in carbon emissions that go along with that has accelerated. We'll talk briefly about which behaviors in our individual lives and our collective lives matter the most that have contributed to this problem in the greatest way. All of that is fine, but if we need to change our minds in order to solve this problem, how malleable is the human brain when you get right down to it? How changeable is it? You often hear people talking about this problem saying, it's human nature, it's baked in, it's hardwired. And I hope by the end of this talk, you will have a different opinion of how flexible versus inflexible the human brain is designed to be. And finally, how do you take all this information to move forward? I will tell you, I um, had never written a book before. I had written plenty of you know, papers in my field, but I had never written a book. And one thing I learned from the process is you don't get to pick the title in an academic press. And I will um, confess here that the, the subtitle about how understanding the brain can help solve the climate crisis is a little bit overblown. This doesn't solve it. It's simply another perspective that some people have told me that they have found useful in understanding what needs to happen and how we might get there. So this is the problem, which you all are so familiar with. For hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of years, there have been carbon fluxes in the, in, in, in the atmosphere. And of course, on the y-axis is the carbon dioxide in parts per million in our atmosphere, and on the x-axis is time in years. And Obviously, there have been fluxes, but what's new about our current time is that very steep uh, curve there, that line really, that is the increase in carbon in our atmosphere since human industrialization. And it is such a dramatic change that many people have said, well, of course, if you just look at this graph, you'll know what the problem is and change your behavior, if only it were that simple. And all of you can read a graph, but you know, I don't need to tell you that there are many people are around the world that don't know how to read a graph like this, and just showing them the facts has not changed opinions. Uh, in my field, in, in medicine, there has been increasing awareness of the 
intersection between climate change and the effects on human health. Obviously, planetary health and ecosystems is a separate question, but in the world of physicians, there has been an, uh, an attempt to create a linkage and um, explain to the public this linkage and the consequences on health of climate change in order to change people's minds about the urgency and need for action in this sphere. So these are some numbers that when I started to go down this path and took the fellowship that Dr. Hess mentioned and had to study this on my own, I did not learn any of this in school. You folks, many of you are students and have learned this in your education, but in my world, I had to learn it as a layperson. And I had some basic questions, uh, which is where did this all come from? Where, uh, where is the genesis of the problem? And what are the numbers that are relevant? And what I learned was that, of course, the United States is the biggest contributor to the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that has led to this problem. So it is, it is our fault in many ways. And because CO2, depending on what part of the cycle you measure, can be said to last in the hundreds, if not thousands of years, um, what's up there now has been put in place and will continue to be the problem because of things that happened in my country. Uh, China now emits the highest amount of carbon dioxide uh, per year. They've surpassed the United States, but we've been at it for longer. And then I needed to know some basic things because this is obviously a question if you're trying to find a solution. How much comes from things we do as individuals in our own lives, decisions we make, and how much comes from things we can't control? These numbers of about half and half are estimates based on many different calculations that people have made. You can find 20%, 80%, you can find 60%, 40%, so forth. And when you put all of these various um, ways of estimating this together, a reasonable figure for a starting point is about half comes from things that we do, but we all do only a little, but there's lots of us, so it makes about half of the emissions. And the other half comes from things like companies, institutions, uh, industries that you as an individual usually, depending on your role, don't, don't have much control over. In the United States, per person, we top out at about 20 tons of carbon dioxide emission per capita per year. There are some more recent estimates that are slightly lower than that, but, but 20 isn't a bad round figure to put in your head. The world average is about five tons per person per year. I looked up Switzerland, and Switzerland, depending on who you read, says 4.4. Uh, tons uh, per person per year up to 14. Why that difference? Because it depends on whether you include in the calculation imported goods and their carbon profile. So what's done on site, manufactured and uh, utilized uh, alone is the, the lower number, but if you count in imported goods, it gets higher. And this is why this is a difficult topic because you can read multiple experts on almost anything and get different numbers. Um, and then the fascinating thing for me and scary thing is that to keep within the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's recommendation of 1.5 degrees, limiting our, our warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we have to get down to about two tons per person per year. So that's a big drop, especially for people in the United States where we are definitely behind you for a whole variety of reasons in per capita carbon emissions. So this is the gory picture slide. Um, this is my world. These are the kinds of things that I have done for 30 years or more. And, um, you know, an obvious question that people asked me when I diverted my career trajectory to focus on this was, whose job is, is this? Why would this be the job of a neurosurgeon to worry about climate change? But if you take that to its further step, whose job would it be? Would it be the truck driver's job? Would it be the politician's job? Politicians, they didn't learn about climate change, they learned about governing. Would it be uh, the policymaker's job? Maybe, but they don't necessarily have a reach over the source of the problem. And one of the difficulties about solving climate change or coming to a better approach is that in some ways it's been nobody's job. It's been the scientist's job to show the problem, it's been policymaker's job in some uh, ways to try to deal with the problem, but I'm, I've come to the conclusion that climate change is like, to use an old metaphor, the largest elephant you can imagine. It's so big you can't even see to the next limb. 
and all of us are touching the elephant with our pinkies, with our eyes closed. And what's required now is we have to fill in the space because you can have multiple climate experts, that's all they do is they study climate, and even they will disagree on the details of the numbers, the predictions, because humans have never been in this situation before. So it isn't hard to understand, if you think about it from this point of view, why we have difficulty. It's a new problem, it's an extraordinarily complex problem, probably one of the biggest we've ever faced as a species. We have no historical record to go back to, to look at how we should solve it. And it's gonna require cooperation among multiple people who already have a day job. So why a neurosurgeon getting involved in climate change? I would say, why not? This is a problem that's going to, and currently is affecting all of us, and it's going to affect uh, people who are at student age now even more. Now, when you think about the kinds of things that make you choose a career or that make you choose uh, an avocation in life, um, you think about what traits about that career decision uh, made you like it. And neurosurgery appeals to one trait that I have, which has been called by some writers biophilia or a love of nature. And if you live here in this city with the landscapes you have around you, I bet most of you have this too, this concept of biophilia, which is an attraction to the natural world. Um, the book goes into a chapter or two about what's the actual scientific evidence that this is something humans have, because you can argue against it that maybe we're afraid of nature. Nature throughout our evolutionary history, yes, it was the source of our sustenance, but it was also the source of a lot of um, destruction and fear for humans. Uh, so it's a hypothesis that we are innately drawn to the natural world. And what I will say is that one of the things that drew me to neurosurgery was that the brain is just cool. It's just neat, it's beautiful. People think, oh, that's icky. No, a, a real human brain in living color right in front of you, it's an amazing, amazing thing. And it is as beautiful to me as trees and mountains and landscapes. It's a, it's a force of nature that I am in awe of in the same way I'm in awe of other aspects of the natural world. So my career choice was in part um, uh, spurred by this natural uh, uh, affinity. But that's not all there is to it. Uh, neurosurgery as a career also um, uh, appeals to people who like to solve problems, which is probably most of you. Uh, curiosity, again, most of you. Altruism, uh, you know, helping people. This, these are all reasons that this career is very rewarding. And you see, I put rewarding here in italics because that concept is gonna come back as we go through this exploration together. But during my life and during many of yours, this increasing problem with carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and, and, and um, climate change has been an increasing stress to many of us. And when we ask the question of whose job is it to solve this, one thing that was really pivotal for me, it's fallen off the slide, is this uh, environmental writer, American environmental writer, Bill McKibben, who was a journalist and became a science writer and now has become an advocate. And Bill McKibben wrote a, uh, a many things about climate change, but one that I read at a pivotal point in my mid-career was this idea that our carbon output in the industrialized wealthy world was like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which many of you may not have ever heard of, but it's a big event in New York City on Thanksgiving, and it's characterized by these big balloons. Uh, it's been around for about 100 years, and uh, all different kinds of pop figures become these big balloons. And what Bill McKibben pointed out is that we in the, in the, in the industrialized wealthy countries like the US, our carbon output is like that big, huge balloon. That happens to be the Pillsbury Doughboy, which is a you know, marketing thing. And around most of the world, their carbon output is like the little party balloon at the side of the parade. And it really brought home to me that this is our fault, this is our responsibility, and it doesn't matter what line of work you're in, the more of us that try to tackle this, the better off we'll potentially be or the closer we'll be to solving the problem. And what Bill McKibben said is that to reduce these carbon emissions, he, th he thought that population was gonna be easier to control, and that's a controversial topic we can touch on, but he thought the problem was the way we live our lives. 
And he said, we simply won't live simply enough soon enough to solve the problem. And that really resonated with me several decades ago when I read that statement. Because that didn't seem surprising at all. Bill McKibben was surprised by that. He said, why is it easier to, to have smaller, num smaller families? Why has that been easier? That seems so biologic. Instead of the way we live and the amount we consume. That seemed to surprise him. And I thought, when I read that, that's not surprising. Because the human brain doesn't like to simplify. You don't like to learn less. You don't like to downsize. Your brain always wants to learn, to do, to experience more. Yes, we all need downtime, but we're always in quest. That's the way our species is, and it's part of why we've been so successful. And how do we decide what we do, what we invest in, what we study, what activities we do, what decisions we make? We, we decide and we learn based on input from this uh, extraordinary system that's in our brains called the reward system. We'll talk a little bit about what does that mean because the word reward does not mean the way we use it in normal conversation. Another truly fundamental characteristic of the human brain is its plasticity. This slide happens to be from my laboratory. It's showing how the brain repairs and recovers itself. This is, happens to be swine after an injury to particular parts of the brain. And it's amazing how it, how it works. And plasticity is not just recovery from an injury, it's also learning a new skill, thinking about things in a new way, learning three or four languages like many of you know how to do us learning how to take the public train from the airport to here. Um, so each thing that you do, each thing that you learn is an example of the plasticity of your brain. But I personally ran into a conflict at this point, which is this is what I do and it's extremely rewarding. It was great to have that kid sitting up eating a cookie the day after major surgery on his brain. It was like so rewarding. It was great to help these families from South America whose kids were born without a cochlea on one side, getting an auditory brainstem implant which goes into the, into the deep parts of the brain to help the kids learn to hear through electronic gizmos that they were not born with. It's extremely satisfying to do this and very rewarding. But at the same time, I recognized that this reward was about me that this is a satisfying and comfortable job. It's got its stresses and strains and anxieties, but I was taking care of one child, one family at a time or several at a time when this other problem of climate change was causing already massive humanitarian problems around the world. It was already affecting conflicts in countries and civil wars were being spurred by years of famine that were causing resource difficulties and people migrating out of um, agricultural devastation and conflicting over resources. Uh, and this is not my patient, but this still should be my problem. Now, one can argue, okay, you're a neurosurgeon, do neurosurgery, don't think about climate change, it's not your shift. And I have certainly heard people express that opinion and they may have a point but it didn't work for me. I couldn't leave it alone. So I decided that the best use of my passion about this and my sense of the enormity of this problem was to combine my background with this problem. And I decided to step back and try to answer a question. What is it about the way our brains evolved and are designed to function that makes it hard for us to change these behaviors that are destroying our planet? That's question one. But question two, which is the more important one, is how much are we able to change? Can we change? Now, I know you all know that there are many levels at which one can study a complicated thing like the human brain. Uh, and uh, Professor Hess studies this at the most elemental and perhaps most important way, which is mathematical, computational, understanding how things work at the, at the molecular level. And then uh, 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 
uh, Mr. Lotiger will be uh, doing the interview later, and he studies things from the point of view of physics because many of our solutions to the climate crisis will come up from technical solutions that help bail us out. So these levels of investigating biology and technology are well above anything that I know anything about, so I will defer to those experts. But the place where I live and work is in the intersection between the, the molecular and cellular design of the brain and how it develops over time, and an actual child. So here's a child that's had surgery, you can see the scar. And what this perspective gives people in my field is a look at the brain in action as a whole unit and as subunits that uh, contribute to how it functions. And brain reward circuitry has been something I've been interested in and studied since my uh, undergraduate years, where I used to put deep brain stimulators into uh, animal brains to try to understand how this system functions. And it's come full circle now. And the question is, what is it that makes us joyful or happy and so satisfied when we win a race and that gives us the, the, the reward of doing all those arduous practices all those years? And we've learned about this so-called reward system from a multitude of, of uh, sources. The oldest way is through lesions th through the brain. So this is the, the famous case of Phineas Gage, who was in the 1800s a railroad worker, and a tamping iron that they used for putting the ties down exploded. It was gunpowder, and it ran right up through his, the top of his eye and up through the top of his head. And that would have been a fatal injury had it been just a little bit off from the trajectory that it followed. Number one, number two, he had a, a, a young uh, physician who recognized that he was getting a brain abscess, which is gonna be the consequence in the 1800s when they didn't have antibiotics, and actually took it upon himself to do the experimental almost uh, uh, drainage of this brain abscess, which saved Phineas Gage's life, and he survived. And it was the, he was the focus of a lot of debate in the medical field. Um, they didn't have the internet, they ha you know, but they had meetings, and. Uh, people debated about what did this tell us, the fact he recovered but didn't recover completely, about the organization of the brain and the effects of different parts of the brain on decision making. Uh, and what we know now about how that system works is that, yes, he had an injury, but he had some plasticity, which is why he recovered to some extent, but the part that he damaged affected his vision and his decision, not his vision, I'm sorry, his um, uh, judgment and his decision making which is part of how the reward system influences you. And then in more recent years, we've had many other techniques from deep brain stimulation in humans where we can implant them, not for experiments, but for medical treatment, usually of Parkinson's disease. And we can, with their consent, test certain things about how the brain works by stimulating and recording from electrodes they have for another reason. Functional MRI, some of you probably work on the physics of MRI scans. This has been revolutionary in trying to understand neuropsychological functions. There are limits to it, but it has opened our eyes to many things. Uh, and all of these kinds of experiments have shed light on how this system works as a unit. So this is when I took my year off, and what I was trying to study was what can available science teach us about the neurobiology of behavior that's relevant to our climate crisis, and in particular, how hard or easy will it be to have people change to different kinds of priorities, uh, looked at through the lens of the reward system. And that's what became the book. I worked with fabulous students. I love working with students. They're, they have such wonderful ideas. And I deliberately chose these students that were my assistants. There were five of them. There are four pictured here to come from different fields. So there was one in economics, and there was one who was neuroscience, and there was one who was um, uh, in sociology and history of medicine, all, all kinds of different fields, and each of them brought a perspective that was extremely useful to our efforts. And what we came up with was, I'll get to the end of the talk now, and then we'll go through how we came up with this. We are lacking in the neural equipment to even perceive carbon dioxide. You can smell ammonia, you can smell flowers, you can smell all kinds of things. You can't smell carbon dioxide, you can't see it, it doesn't show up. Uh, and so why is it surprising that people have had difficulty perceiving this rapid change in carbon dioxide. We can't, we can't perceive it, we don't have the equipment. 
Another conclusion was that pro-environmental behavior, decisions that help the environment, just in general, are not very rewarding. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail on that. And then we created, my students and I, a, a test case to try to see if you make a pro-environmental decision more rewarding, can you influence people's behavior? So we'll talk about what that means in a moment. Now, I want to put a caveat in here, which is the one people bring up most often, which is, what difference does it make what an individual does? That's not going to solve the problem. This is collective. This is political. This is global. Um, I can't change ExxonMobil. I can't change you know, solar panels. I can't do any of that. Nothing I do as an individual matters. And what I would say is that if you go back to that CO2 equation, about half com does come from our individual behavior and half comes from things that most of us can't control. But that's not the right question. The right question is, how does the mind change of a CEO of a company? How does the mind change of a president of a university or a middle manager of a manufacturing plant or a politician? These people have a scope of decision making that may affect many people. So it's not correct to say that if we're talking about how to change a person's mind through the human brain, that that means that that change only affects your domestic personal choices. No, it may affect how much you prioritize whatever your decisions are in whatever sphere of influence, which can be very large. You may be an artist who decides to do all your art on bringing attention to climate change. You may be a filmmaker, and it, it doesn't mean that you're only going to decide where you put your bottle in which bin. So it's even though there is no such thing as collective decision making, you make your decision one at a time, and then it spreads to other people. Now let's talk just a little bit about what we mean by reward. Some of you know this because you're studying it here in school or you research it yourself. But reward is not what makes you feel good. It's not like getting a reward because you used your credit card so many times you get points or you get frequent flyer miles or whatever it is that you do. It's your brain's mechanism that teaches you what you need to survive. That's what it's all about. That's how it evolved. That's what it's for. And so our brains evolved for survival. And the reason humans have been so successful is that we've been very adaptable because we can learn what we need to survive. We can figure it out and learn it and teach it to others. And that's how we've come to populate the whole world and cause the climate crisis problem. We didn't know that it was going to cause a problem. Now, once we knew, we should have stopped. But early on, these were problem-solving solutions. So the squirrel likes, seeks, finds, eats, and hides and stores nuts because that is how its brain works to survive a harsh winter. Likewise, early humans learned, figured out, taught others uh, how to fish, how to farm, how to have shelter, uh, how to store things. And that's why they survived, because they could do it, they could learn it. And it was the reward system that taught them these things. That's what it does. The problem now is that we did not have any reason evolutionarily to develop really strong breaks that says, this is too much. Wait, stop, that's icky. Now, yes, if you eat three of those hamburgers like that, you're, you're going to feel crummy. But by and large, it's almost humanly impossible to eat so much you burst or hurt yourself. I mean, you can under extreme circumstances. But our brains didn't catch up that that is not healthy. That is not good for you. And likewise, I always hesitate showing this picture. I got it off the internet that it's actually somebody's house in my audience. This is nobody's house here, right? Nobody lives now. Doesn't, doesn't look like a house I've seen around here. Um, but somebody owns that house. Does anybody need a house like that? No, nobody needs it. Nobody needs that meal and nobody needs that house. And those urges that happen because our reward system actually tells you that's rewarding on some level are counterproductive a conflict of interest for our survival at this point. Our reward mechanism that taught us how to survive is now teaching us or has uh, uh, rewarding us for behaviors that are actually a conflict of interest for our survival. And what neuroscience allows you to do, just like all science, is it allows you to have an arm's length view so that instead of judging 
people for eating that meal or buying that house. You can look at it from a point of view of objectivity and say, what is it about the brain that has made this happen? So to understand the evolution of the reward system, my students and I came up with this uh, illustration. So to understand this, this is a little bit American-centric, I'm sorry, it's a map of the United States. And we came up with um, a timeline. So you're taking a walk, you start in San Francisco, California, and you end up in the center of Times Square in New York City. And if you walk at Google Walk pace, it will take you 40 days if you never stop as an exercise. And on this map, this is where the Earth starts, and this is now. So what we're going to look at is your walk, and up here is brain evolution at various times in your walk, because this is the history of our planet from beginning to now. So life begins in Salt Lake City. Again, you don't necessarily know these places, so they're on the map, but you know this is when the planet begins, life begins here uh, about 3.5 billion years ago. You don't get to multicellular organisms until Iowa City, a little bit more than halfway. You don't get to mammals until Scranton, Pennsylvania. You're getting close to the East Coast. You don't get to primates until Morristown, New Jersey, right outside of New York. Now we have to do a blow up of the current time. You don't get to humans until you have 223 yards left. I know you do meters, but it's almost the same. And here is our carbon profile. It lines up with this time. This is the Anthropocene, when the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has skyrocketed. This is a blow up of here. You don't get to the Anthropocene, climate change, until your big toe hits the ground on your last step of this 40-day walk. That's how recent it is in our history. But your brains and your decision making and your reward system and your cognition and all these things that have to interface to help you make decisions, it started back here. It started with single cell organisms, and it got more and more refined over these years. But most of what we use to make decisions comes from back here. Our brains have not changed anatomically or physiologically in this period of time. So why is it surprising that we make our decisions like we still lived back then? Oh, I keep looking to press the button, but it's here. And some people here that I, I met, some neuroscience people uh, earlier today, and some of you study this kind of thing, some of you have probably made discoveries in this sort of thing, but even in single cells like bacteria, most of the way we work, as you know, has to do with changes in the composition of chemicals on the surfaces of things, that when they encounter another chemical, they change shape, allowing different ions, different other kinds of chemicals to go in and out of cells. That's the basic key to how we work as biologic beings. It's not magical, it's not Harry Potter. There's explanations for all of it. And so, in single cell organisms, the 3D conformational changes when a bacteria hits a glucose molecule or an ammonia molecule have been worked out in great detail, perhaps by some of you. And from there, we can get to organisms like C. elegans, understanding the exact molecular ionic changes that allow uh, learning to occur, and in aplesia, it's been worked out, now this is a sea slug, about a foot long, and in aplesia, it's been understood exactly what neurons are activated, what neurotransmitters are released to enhance learning when something important for survival occurs to that animal. And this is the reward system, when something that is positive for survival happens to you, uh, you have a release of neurotransmitter that will facilitate that same thing happening the next time you're in those circumstances. That's how it works. It's like oiling the machine when something positive happens. And once we get to mammals, you're all, almost at the end, you're almost at the, the East Coast by now. Uh, now we're talking about millions of neurons, uh, 70 million in mice, 200 million in um, rats. They have more options, more decisions, more learning to do. They are much more complicated in their behavioral repertoire. And what we've learned from the reward system at this scale is that your reward system is tuned. That is, it is designed to work best and most effectively and be most rewarding when you encounter small, unexpected, and variable rewards. So the human analog to think about this is, imagine that you're 
a prehistoric human and you're hot and you're, and you're wet and uncomfortable and hungry and thirsty and you come upon a little patch of berries in the forest, those berries are so rewarding. If you've been camping or whatever and you, know, you have those like, dehydrated meals and you pull them out and you've been camping all day and you're hot and tired and, and, you, and you, you put one of those in a little boiling water, it's like nirvana, even though it's yucky because that's the way your reward system is tuned to be maximally rewarded. That is not what we have in modern life. Our modern life rewards are on a totally different schedule uh, and they don't follow that. We can talk for a long time about why some people believe that that is part of our dysphoria collectively. Um, I'm not sure I totally buy that, but it's an interesting idea. So humans, 223 yards till the current time on our timeline. We have two and a half minutes to go. The human brain has an amazing 86 billion neurons, each with about 10,000 connections. It's an extraordinarily awesome invention of nature. And this is just a diagram that we made for the purposes of the book, whoops, sorry, to um, understand some of the anatomy. If anybody does read this book, you can skim chapter two, it goes into detail, but it's way too much detail for most people and it's really boring. So, what influences our decision? Our brain weighs choices second to second and makes what we call utility calculations when you're coming up with a decision. These, how you weigh your decision, not consciously, most of this is millions of events happening because of your past and your heredity and your genetics and your specific profile and what happened to you when you were a child and what happened to you yesterday. All of these things influence every decision that you're not even aware of. And they depend on, as we say, heredity, experience, circumstances, what's happening to you right now, uh, who's around you, what color the room is, all of these things influence your decision. And they're all mediated by the reward system. We, we shorten it by saying dopamine, there are other neurotransmitters involved, but dopamine is the predominant one that's been studied the most. And Again, to get away from the concept that we're hardwired, we do have general tendencies. Most of our general tendencies come from our heredity that we have in common that happened on the earlier parts of that timeline. But we are also flexible by design. These photographs are of the mouse hippocampus. This comes from a lab I collaborate with just to show you the beauty and complexity of these circuits. Now, you can't study human behavior at the level of these cells unless you have deep brain stimulators in. So what people have had to use other tools. And one of the main ones have been game theory computerized gaming uh, and in association with oftentimes functional imaging, MRI is the big one. And what this has shown is that most of us do not make purely rational financial decisions. Why are we talking about money? Because money is the root of a lot of the problem from climate change because people have financial interests uh, in uh, keeping fossil fuels going and financial penalties for transitioning. So money plays a big part in the equations here for climate change. And to understand why humans have trouble, it's useful, I think, to understand how we deal with money neurologically. Reward, it turns out, is more valuable for most of us, all other things being equal, when it's unexpected. That harkens back to our evolutionary design of unexpected um, intermittent variable rewards that are small. We humans are more rewarded, all other things being equal, when we make more or get more than somebody else. So if you get an A but your sweet mate gets a B, you're even happier about that A. It's bad, I mean, I'm not saying you wanna admit to this, but that's how we generally work. And also, we uh, find rewards more valuable if we get more than we predicted. That's the unexpected part of it. But reward is tempered by somebody else getting more. So if you get $10 and somebody else gets $15, your reward of that $10 is less. Uh, and humans are unique in that we are less rewarded by something if we know by fact that we could have gotten even more. So even if it's small, variable, intermittent, unexpected, it is moderated by knowing that we could have made more. And there's a whole series of experiments that have shown this using deep brain stimulation, functional MRI, and um, gaming theory. So the overall accumulated tendency of all this is that humans in general, all other things being equal, are motivated to get more and more and more. This is not because we're bad or evil, it's because this was 
one of the keys to our success as a species. So I just want to give you a little thought experiment to see this in action. And the principle that we're, we're uh, uh, testing here is that it's more fun or rewarding or satisfying, those are all ways of saying the same thing neurologically, to get more, to do more, to experience more than it is to simplify. Remember, Bill McKibben said, why can't we just simplify? I'm surprised we can't do that. And I would say it's, it's explained by how our brains work. So this is your little thought experiment. The experiment is, think about what's more fun. Don't think about what's the right thing to do, the correct thing to do, the appropriate thing to do. I just want you to use the term fun in your head. Is it more fun when you're thinking about getting a new car, to think about the make and the model and the color and the interior, or is it more fun to think about the mileage chart? Is it more fun, this is, this is my house, and uh, this is you know the American Halloween holiday. I don't know, do you guys do Halloween here in Switzerland? It's a big deal where we are, and it's, it's, is it more, for the question is, is it more fun to decorate your house, or is it more fun to put in attic insulation? So I would guess most of you would think it's more fun to decorate than it is to put in attic insulation. So this is a pro-environmental behavior. Thinking about the mileage is pro-environmental. It's not much fun. And what fun means in neurobiologic terms, fun equals reward for the most part. Fun is the way that your brain works. That's what your subjective feeling is. If it's fun, it was rewarding, almost always. If it's not fun, not very rewarding. And limiting consumption, whether it's gas or whether it's, you know, attic insulation, is simply, in general, not very rewarding. Now, there's a caveat to that. If you're really worried about climate change, it may be rewarding because it may give you a little bit of relief. But as an activity in and of itself, apart from all these other things, by and large, most of these things are not very much fun. But here's the key question. How do we decide and learn what is valuable and rewarding? How do, how do we know? I mean, you can change your mind, right? And the answer is some of it is genetic, based on these survival principles that we all inherited together, or studies have shown that certain people have certain tendencies. For example, political conservatism, versus political liberalness has both a nature and a nurture component. There are certain genotypes of certain dopaminergic receptor subtypes that make people more one way than the other. You inherited that. There are certain environmental things that have the same. A lot of that work has been done with twin studies. So your genetics play a big role on what you find valuable and rewarding, like food, right? Most people find food rewarding of some, of some kind. Um, if it weren't, we wouldn't survive. But your experience, your life events and cultural learning also play a big role. And this concept of gullibility, and here we don't mean gullible like you're stupid or naive, we mean gullible, which is the human tendency to believe what you're told by authority figures. This is just uh, one of the um, old uh, amphitheaters in my hospital that was uh, an original uh, operating room when they had to use natural light, and now it's used for teaching. The things you're taught by your mentors are very hard to shake. And this tendency of gullibility is important to our survival because if you were um, about to step on uh, an ant's nest or you were about to go over a cliff or fall into a, uh, a lake, um, and your grandmother or uncle or older brother said stop and you didn't stop, we would not have survived. So we have a built-in survival mechanism, which is to believe our first pass is to believe what we're told by authority figures. And this plays a lot in the values that we choose and in those things that we find rewarding. But what we value can vary dramatically among people and in the same person over time. So we're gonna look at some examples. So this is the most dramatic one. Um, it's in the book in more detail with references, but in parts of Europe, I don't know if it was in Switzerland or not, but in parts of Europe, in the Middle Ages, one of the big events that families would go to, the kids would go, everybody would go, it was a big deal. The whole town would go to these events and uh, what the events were was as you got closer, you'd start to smell fire and you'd start to hear howling. And the more the howling went, the happier the people were and they'd clap and they'd cheer and they'd crane their necks to see. And what, were, what was the, the center here? It was live cats being held by their tails by ropes and dropped into fires. 
and the louder they would scream because ultimately they would catch fire and die a miserable death, uh, the more they were tortured, the happier the people were. Why? Isn't that horrible? I mean, I don't even like talking about it. It's because at that time, religious leaders um, taught people and presumably believed that the devil was in cats and that if you tortured cats, you were torturing the devil. Now, there is historical evidence that this helped uh, contribute to the plague in Europe because so many cats were killed. And of course, the plague was carried by uh, rodents. Contrast that to ancient Egypt where cats were you know, considered divine and worshiped and buried in fancy gold sarcophaguses. Uh, and why? Because the cats, presumably, kept the rats out of the granaries, so cats were valued. Same animal, two different times, two different cultures, two different cultural learnings about it, and a totally different valuation of the same creature. As a quick aside, contemporary life in wealthy countries has accelerated consumption. And there's been a number of people, none of this is my work, I'm just quoting others. Uh, it, it's, there's, there's been a number of studies that show why this is. In prehistoric societies and even early agricultural societies, everything you consumed was the same thing everybody else consumed, and it was very public. You couldn't hide it. We lived communally. And if you had excess or waste, you couldn't hide that either. It was all visible to the entire community. You also had mixing of ages, so you had elders and, and younger people together throughout the life of a community. And uh, you didn't have what we have now, which is ease of access, immediate reward, because you can get it on, for us it's Amazon, I, I don't know how, how you get your stuff, uh, and, you can, and, and you get two rewards, because when you buy it and then when it's delivered, um, purchasing and waste happen in private, Advertising has been come, become very clever. If any of you are in marketing or communication, uh, a lot of this neural uh, experimentation came from the marketing field to try to understand how to influence people's choices and behaviors, even when it's not in their best interest. Um, and age segregation has played a big role too, because you don't have people you don't have people across the age spectrum moderating your choices, and there's intense competition for peer recognition at this age. We've prolonged adolescence in modern society, uh, and there's a lot of purchasing power in wealthy countries, so it's the, the focus of a lot of marketing. We also have a non-evolutionary reward uh, schedule, which is, remember, small, intermittent, variable rewards. That's not typically our reward system. And also, the pace of change may be outstripping our ability to adapt, which contributes to eco-depression. So this is Moore's Law. As many of you know, it's a logarithmic scale, and it's the pace of change in semiconductors. And it looks linear because it's logarithmic, so the idea is that the pace of change in technology and science are logarithmic, and that cultural change lags behind, and that we can adapt to change in our lives at a certain pace, and we may have outstripped it, and then you add in that the very earth is changing, that we have relied on for all of human existence, um, and it's just unmooring and unsettling, and people believe that this contributes to the eco-depression and eco-anxiety that we have that we'll talk about later. But beyond just material acquisition, which is what we've been talking about, there is a universe of human rewards. It's not all about getting more, more, more. If it were, we would not have survived this long. There are pro-social rewards, like taking care of other people and, and society. Uh, there's the reward of agency, which is part of the big appeal to surgery. It's immediate, you fix somebody, and they get better. It's wonderful. There's novelty, which we are drawn to, and also familiarity, which we are drawn to. So these are all other aspects of the reward system that play into how we make our decisions. But pro-environmental behavior in the modern world also suffers from an agency problem. So in prehistory, if you were a hunter-gatherer, you, you got your food, you got it right away, you saw it, you shared it, it was, it was right away. You built your shelter, this one happens to be in Ireland, you made your tool, you did it, you worked on it, you completed your task, you got your results right away. And that's part of the appeal of surgery as a career. But here's uh, my colleague um, who is in the Center of the Environment and Health with me, riding his bike in November in Boston. It's crummy out. Uh, he does not see the pro-environmental consequence of this. He knows he should do it, 
but it's not like he sees it. It's not like he built a tool and he has it in his hand. He's reducing his potential carbon for some theoretic, you know, global problem. It's not immediately rewarding, and you're not working towards something that you can even conceptualize very easily compared to taking the car or another way to get to work that is more carbon intense, uh, but a lot more convenient and comfortable. So with that as a background, what can we do? What should we do? How do we go from here? Well, people have worked on this, as many of you know, to try to see if we did this, where would we be? If we did that, where would we be with our carbon? So this is the Interna uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report from 2021. And these various lines here um, represent different pathways that society could take. These SSP things stand for Shared Socioeconomic Pathway. This is the carbon on the y-axis, and these are the years on the x-axis. And depending on our choices, these trajectories to carbon, carbon neutrality being here, are going to happen at different magnitudes and different paces. And before technology bails us out with new ways to create our insatiable need for energy, to use a pandemic uh, metaphor, we need to flatten the curve. We need to get from you know, this one down to these lower ones, ideally the ones that are going towards carbon neutrality and not going up into the stratosphere. So we don't have to get rid of all fossil fuel immediately. And if you hear, as many of us do, that we have five years or 10 years or we're doomed, there are lots of different opinions on that. And there are many people who feel that we will not get rid of fossil fuels, but we will reduce them at the same time that we increase other forms of energy. And it's the pace at which we do this that will affect these various trajectories. And it's also going to affect where we do them and who has the brunt of the burden in terms of equitability of our changes. So what do we need to do? We need to decrease fossil fuel and greenhouse gas consumption and waste. We need to accelerate carbon capture. That's not going to be the answer in and of itself. One of the problems with this whole difficult area of climate change is there is no one solution. It isn't, it isn't our individual behavior or corporate governmental policies. It's both. It isn't this or that. It's both. It isn't just decreasing fossil fuel. It's not just accelerating carbon capture. All of these things for this big elephant that we're each touching with our pinky have to happen simultaneously. We do have to level our population growth and redistribute our population. That's a controversial topic. We can talk about it offline. We do absolutely have to address land use and biodiversity. And we do have to adapt to climate effects equitably because many parts of the world are going to see this much wor worse than I am in Boston or you are in Switzerland if you believe the projections. So let's just talk about, I had to learn from starting from nothing, what individual behaviors are the most important? We're raised as children to recycle and put things in the right container. Is that, is that the answer? And I was surprised at the list of the most individual um, carbon intense behaviors uh, that people can make. Transportation in most countries, at least in the United States, is the biggest one. You have much, much better rail system in public transportation than we do. Uh, you're way ahead of us on that. But in the United States, this is one of the big ones. Moving to a plant-based diet, it doesn't mean you can't eat meat at all. But the more plant-based you go, the lower your carbon footprint, by and large, all other things being equal. Airplanes, I didn't realize this was such a big deal. Uh, in my hospital, one of the biggest contributors to climate change that we do is we go to meetings and we have people come for interviews. And those are huge uses of carbon. One transatlantic or cross United States round trip uses up two tons of carbon per person. That's our entire year's allotment from that earlier slide. Considering population size, a tough question. You can read all kinds of things that population is not the problem, population is the problem, population even as a consideration is unethical and unfair. There's many different points of view on this. So of these behaviors, is it easy or difficult? Is it rewarding to do these things? And then what about the money side? If you're in a business or you're in education or you're in an institution or you're a legislator, that's the United States Capitol building, how do we overcome the tendency of people to be greedy and want more and more and more, which we can say is their fault or you can look at it from a brain point of view and say that's the way we oftentimes have a tendency to be designed. 
So when I was trying to answer these questions myself, I looked back at public health and medicine, which is the area I know, you know I'm most familiar with. So I looked at two different problems of difficult behavior change. Addiction, which is at the individual level, and the West African Ebola epidemic of 2014, which was at a community and um, uh, collective level, a culture change level. And these are the basic principles that come out of looking at difficult behavior change having nothing to do with climate change that I discovered. Um, one is that, in general, positive works better than negative. If you have a professor who gives you praise for your effort for getting a little better on a paper you're working on, as opposed to somebody that gives you nothing but red line comments and makes you feel bad, the positive is likely to motivate you to work better. Not always, but most of the time. Another important principle is that the information that you get comes from people you know and trust. And there's a lot of evidence detailed in the book as to what, uh, what um, uh, goes into this sort of thing. But one of the problems with the Ebola epidemic is that the information about how to do things was coming from strangers that people didn't trust. Likewise, climate change in the United States, a lot of information comes from scholars that people don't know. They don't know their community leaders and so forth. If you get a substitute reward that is immediate and tangible for the thing you're giving up, it's much more effective. Uh, and that's a lot of uh, how 12-step recovery programs in addiction work. Social rewards are powerful, also a big deal here and was important in the Ebola epidemic. Um, multiple behavior strategies at once, that's also true for addiction and the Ebola epidemic. What hap had to happen there is that people that those communities knew and trusted had to start educating them in different ways of doing things that did not contradict their religious beliefs that were of extreme importance to them. So they had to find workarounds that came from their own internal authority figures, like we said earlier. Uh, nudging and budging are other concepts in behavior change that have been applied to the climate change world in a variety of ways. So let's move from general behavior like addiction and the Ebola epidemic to pro-environmental behavior. Well, what's been shown in the research is that the change has to be more rewarding than the alternative. And one of the strategies that's worked for, for companies and for people is doing things differently, not doing without. Organizations, again, Europe tends to be ahead of the United States, is uh, the Eco Teams program in Europe, which we can talk about later. There are all kinds of other things, the Sunrise Movement. And what these substitute for what you're giving up, which might be convenience and the way you know how to do things, is social reward. Each of these organizations makes you feel, feel part of something important, part of a movement, gives you social skills and social interaction. Financial incentives, that's more the budging than the nudging, comes from, uh, towards businesses and institutions, comes from regulatory changes, changing things like building codes, uh, making laws, that's a, a, a metric from the Environmental Defense Fund, which sues people in the United States for uh, breaking environmental laws, public pressure campaigns, exposing motives, like that a lot of recycling came from the petroleum industry because they wanted to make plastics and they wanted people to feel good about using plastics, and so they told everybody, if you recycle, everything will be okay, but only 6% of plastic is recycled. So. You've got to uncover the motives to make people understand why what they're taught may not be true. Uh, social rewards do nudge people away from the tragedy of the commons, which is people using resources e extensively until there are no resources left. But there's another concept that I think is becoming increasingly important, and that's this concept of honeybee rewards, which is that the honeybee pollinates the flowers not because the honeybee is pollinating the flowers to be nice to the flowers. The honeybee is pollinating the flowers to get the nectar. Likewise, Ford has done a really good job of convincing people who don't even believe in climate change to buy this electric truck because it's big and brawny and fast and accelerates really quickly and it's really powerful. They're buying it for the honeybee reward. They're not doing it to pollinate the flowers. They're doing it to get the honey. And because they're making a product that appeals to people apart from the climate change uh, mindset, but is really good for climate change, you can argue about the manufacturing and all of that, that's how change is being made. So we're getting to the end. How changeable are we? How easy is it to change what's rewarding? I've given you some examples with the cats, but there are others. Before the last 15 years, four-month-old babies could not swipe a screen 
if you put a tablet in the baby's hand, it would not even know what to do with it. It's not rewarding. You can take a four-month-old baby and teach the baby how to scroll on a touch screen now, four months old, before they can sit, before most of them can roll over. And when you take it away from them, they're dysphoric, they cry. That's a major change in what's rewarding in a very short period of time. Likewise, we are so flexible that even something as important to survival as eating can become aversive or negative. This is a study that was done with fMRI with patients with anorexia nervosa who, when compared to people who don't have that eating disorder, the same parts of their brain become activated from the thought of not eating as do in people without that disorder when they think about eating. It's a 180 degrees turn, and the reason I think it's such a powerful example is that it's so counterintuitive about survival, like you need food to survive, and yet the brain is so flexible that in people with this disorder, going without food becomes as rewarding as, as having food. Amazing, that, that plasticity of the brain. Likewise, because we're getting more and more concerned about this trajectory, we can substitute. So if you want this, you can now get this. That's a big Hummer gas guzzler, that's a Rivian. Does all the same things. Uh, if you are into high tech and you want a really cool car, I won't get into Elon Musk, but uh, you can get a Tesla and it's a honeybee reward, the environmental things. Or you can get something that is pro-environmental and it's not so high tech, but you feel better about it because it makes you feel better about this problem. Likewise, you want new furniture? You can be subject to the marketing people who know exactly what buttons of yours to push and go to some fancy high-end furniture store and get new furniture, or you can go to a thrift store or a second-hand store and get some really cool things that you like, that you fix up, that become part of your passed down heritage without getting new stuff that is not pro-environmental. So making this appealing to people through marketing through articles, through communication skills, many of you study these things, has become part of the pro-environmental strategy. But here's the funny thing. Acquisition of stuff, it turns out, in long-term happiness studies, doesn't even make us happy. Stuff doesn't make us happy. Study after study has shown that a sense of purpose and relationships matter much more to long-term life satisfaction, what we can also call happiness. So stuff is a short-term dopaminergic reward that doesn't bring you happiness. Yes, if you're impoverished, having stuff enough to survive is critical and makes you feel better. But if you're in a wealthy situation, getting more stuff is very short-term and doesn't give you what most people want, which is long-term happiness. I'm gonna not spend much time on the Green Children's Hospital project except to say that it was an experiment to see if I could get my hospital to do something very pro-environmental and very much of an investment to link the pro-environmental side to improved health, indoor air quality, lower mortality. These all are things that came out of research that other people did, and then link it to the reward of extreme biophilic design. You guys have these beautiful meadows coming up all over your campus. There are reasons for that. It's good for your mental health for most of us. And in a hospital setting, it's also been shown to do that. But I wanted to make the most extreme prototype hospital as a laboratory that combined these things. And I wanted my hospital to do it for reasons that had nothing to do with climate change. I didn't succeed yet. I need a big donor if anybody's willing. Uh, but we did get many um, pro-environmental decisions made, and we tipped the needle, we formed a new center, and the hospital has not said we can't do this with a hospital, we just need to find somebody who's willing to pony up. So, conclusions, I know this probably ran over. Um, pro-environmental behavior change is challenging, it's not surprising from a neural point of view. It won't feel like other rewards, it won't feel like, um, you know, getting a, uh, perfect dive in the high dive. It won't feel like getting an A plus on your exam. It's gonna feel differently because our reward system has not caught up with this particular set of needs. Uh, we need to substitute new rewards for prior ones, whether you're an individual making individual decisions, uh, an educator making decisions for your university, a company executive, or a politician. 
What's rewarding can be changed. Think of the cats, think of the honeybee rewards. We can change what we prioritize, and that's going to be essential and is what is driving the change. Pro-environmental rewards are mostly social. So if you're a CEO and it's going to decrease your bottom line margin to make a pro-environmental change in your manufacturing, if you find other CEOs and you do it together and you all commit to this, you're much more likely to be successful and to stick to your decision. Advocacy, policy, legal remedies, economics, and behavior are all linked. These are how these things change from one level to another. But each of you in this audience does have the capacity to make a difference. Because when you talk about it, when you care about it, the fact you came to this lecture means that you probably have at least a little bit of interest in it. What you think is going to affect how rewarding this topic and these changes are to other people around you. They may poo-poo it, your family members, they may say, nah, but it will weigh on them. It will become part of their brains. That's how it works. And you will have an effect even if you don't know it right away. So a vision for our future, I am actually not so pessimistic. I think we are going to, things are by physics, by laws of physics. Um, they're gonna get worse before they get better. Climate change is, even if we stopped all carbon emissions today, climate change would get worse. But we can flatten the curve, and I think people like you are going to help this happen. I do think from my, not just my own opinions, but from the experts that I hang around with, that that speak into my ears and know so much more than I do. Most of them think we are going to get through this crisis. It's gonna be hard, there's gonna be a lot of suffering, but we each can play a role in mitigating that suffering and also in helping for adaptation that is more just and equitable around the world. So my journey has been to try to combine the things I know, each of you has your own skills, your own knowledge, your own learning, your own passion, if you care about this problem, you have something you can bring to it. It's such a big problem, we all have something we can bring to it, whether it's in your own life or it's in your professional life or the broader role that you play in your community. So I thank you for your attention. I'm really looking forward to taking questions. I wanna hear pushback and your own ideas because this is how we all grow. So thanks very much. get to sit down now? Do you want to introduce yourself? Um, yes, I can, quickly. Um, I'm Pierre Lottiger. I'm working at the Semiconductors uh, Laboratory for um, light applications, mainly, uh, here at LAS, uh, at the EPFL. And uh, today I have the great pleasure to, to ask uh, questions. Um, Do you notice I ran really long, so he couldn't ask me too many. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the very interesting, interesting uh, talk. It was uh, really, um, yeah, it touched me a lot in various, um, various ways. And uh, yeah, it, this is also um, why I'm going to ask some questions that are, um, in my opinion, um, my feelings about that. Um, and maybe I can start. So the first one, maybe. Be today, um, more and more people are, are prone to feeling eco anxiety, and so across even across all ages. So um, my question now is, uh, how could you explain this feeling from a neuroscientific point of view, and uh, could the mechanism of the feeling itself help to to generate actions or to to have help us moving? In fact, thanks. That's a great question. Eco-anxiety and eco-depression, when I first heard the terms, I thought that it was a joke. I thought, that, that's funny, that's like a funny turn of words. It is such a recognized diagnosis now that my friends in psychiatry and psychology have become specialists in it, particularly for younger people, because this is the most frightening for those who have the longest lifespan. There, um, societies have had to get together to define even what this means. And their operational definition of eco-anxiety is that this is normal. This is a normal reaction to a real threat. Eco-depression 
they define as when it gets to the point where you no longer can act. So when it is maladaptive and, you, and it's so bad that you can't do anything, then it's not healthy and pathologic. But eco-anxiety can spur people to action. It's a normal reaction to be scared for this stuff. I'm fr terrified. But I'm not so terrified. I mean, in fact, my whole journey was because I was anxious about it and said, I, I have to try to play some role. And each of you, as I say, have that role. But what is it from a neurologic point of view, which was your question? It's the brain's normal reaction to a threat is to perseverate, to think about it, to try to learn about it, to talk to others about it, to try to put it at bay as best you can. And the reason I think that this problem is so difficult is number one, you don't know where to start to help fix it. It seems so large and it is so large. And number two, it is something we've never faced and the fact that the very earth is changing is terrifying. You can't count on weather. You can't count on the plants and the birds and the bees and all the things that you grew up with being the same. I believe that climate change is a part of the trajectory of the human's difficulty with coping with the rapid pace of change, which is accelerating. And when the very earth is changing, I think we are starting to get to change that is so fast that is difficult for us neurally to process it. And I think of other issues, artificial intelligence. It, it, you know, foom, like that wasn't even a word a few years ago. Um, genetic engineering. All of these things where technology has, to some extent, made things happen so quickly that it's hard for us to even conceptualize them or to look ahead. We don't have a past to look at. And I think eco-anxiety is one more layer at that difficult processing the pace of change because we don't know what to expect in our planet. What can people do about eco-anxiety? You didn't ask me that, but I've asked many of my colleagues. And taking action, there's not much research in this, but there's a little bit of research that suggests taking environmental action can help mitigate it. But talking to your friends and doing things collectively is where many kinds of mental distress are best dealt with. So, you know, joining clubs, organizations, talking to your professors, being part of collective movements, all of those things may help. If you're in eco-depression where you're paralyzed, then you need to get professional help. Mm. Okay, so let's hope uh, it will just help us move individually and <laughs> not get us into the, <laughs> the dark side of it. <laughs> um, but yes, individual actions. Um, now I'm thinking about uh, Pierre Rabhi, who was um, an agricultural, uh, French agricultural, um, and he was working on this, the concept of sobriety. So um, he has an, an image of um, Colibri doing each of them their own work facing um, a forest burning to, to add little droplets of water to extinguish the fire. And um, in this sense, um, could, we, um, could we still use this, uh, this metaphor for, for climate change in our individual um, ways when there is so much, um, um, so much pressure from the big lobbies uh, where we need to, to reach a critical mass somehow? And um, yes, how could we use to uh, neurosciences to, to bridge the gap um, and, uh, and facilitate these collective actions, um, also taking advantage maybe of the individual rewards? I think you already talked a bit about this, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. This idea of individual versus collective behavior is a really challenging one because people think if you're talking about the brain, you are only talking about individual behavior. Mm -hmm. But let's use your agricultural philosopher example here. There was a person who was charismatic and could move many people. That's a skill some people have. They are leaders. They are natural leaders. They know how to communicate. They know how to be an example. And they will get many other people involved. And so here's a person with individual action. You do this. You change your landscape. You change your agriculture. But it spread. So it was one person whose mind was changed in an important way based on the facts and his own knowledge, and he spread that to many other people. So it's a person that had a big impact. 
And I think that there is room in this crisis for people at all levels of impact, you know. As I said, if you're the president of a college or the dean of a college, you may have to make some tough choices about do I spend money on this, do I get a new research building, or do we decarbonize? I'm making that up. I don't know how you're facing it, but we certainly are facing some of those decisions. Honestly, most college administrators or hospital administrators, they're going to want the new research building. That's what they do. That's not hard to understand. Making a decision for something kind of vague about climate change, what are they going to buckle under? Pressure from students. That's what happened at Harvard. You know, the students protested about divest, 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 get your earnings out, and they finally had to cave. So the students individually don't feel like they can do anything, but together they embarrassed the organization to ch make a change. So the point is, it's at every level. It's sometimes top-down, Patagonia, you know, like the CEO of Patagonia changed the culture of the company. Most times it is happening because something's happening at the top to make the incentives, whether it's legislation or a tax break or whatever it is, um, new building code, so they have to make the change saving money because renewable energy is actually getting cheaper, right? So it may be an economic decision. That combined with bottom-up, it's when they meet that things happen. Mm -hmm. So I think, to answer your question, all of this is consistent with what we know about how the brain works. Your decisions are not in isolation. Your decisions happen because of so many influences. If you're the CEO of a company, or you're the dean of a college, or you're the head of a hospital, your mind is changed by what you're exposed to around you. And some of that is people that are working individually, but together. Okay, so maybe it's what you were in the three different mechanisms of uh, genetics, uh, experience, and also the circumstances, we can, we can take advantage of the circumstances. But maybe also of a second one, and here I have an, another question, um, because at EPFL the, the role is mainly to educate people to, um, it's, it's a high education place, and um, could we, could education take advantage of the um, neuroscientific um, uh, point of view, the neuroscientific ways of uh, regarding rewards to, to help people of the new generations make uh, change more efficiently? You can't avoid it. Education changes your brain. Everything you do, every moment changes your brain. So if an educational institution chooses as a principle like yours did that sustainability, equitability are part of your core values, it's going to change you. So absolutely, education, the philosophy of your elders, you are gullible. No offense, I'm gullible. We're all gullible. It took me years to not do things the way I was taught as a surgeon because my mentors told me this. Like, they told me that, so I have to do it that way. And each of us has the opportunity to be influenced by the culture we live in and the values that we absorb, and then to express them and also to question them constantly. The best thing educators can do, and I, I know this institution shares this value, is teach you to think critically, to consider the null hypothesis, to consider an alternative, because that's how progress is made. But absolutely, education, not just about the facts, but about what you can do, and enabling through talks like this and the others in your series and by your values, enabling people to feel empowered, not just because they feel empowered, but because they actually see changes that they can make. And so education absolutely plays a critical role and will continue to do so. And there is no better example than this campus and what you're doing here. It's a wonderful example of how a mission-driven institution in people at formative stages of their lives and where some of their values are being questioned and made, it's going to influence you and it's going to influence those that you teach and those that you raise in your families or talk to. So you will have a ripple effect that will be powerful. So I think it's one of the best vehicles uh, for making change. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we already needed time, also needed time for Q&A session, or do we have? I think you're okay. probably all exhausted. It's a lot, but I'm happy to take questions if there are any, and they can be controversial. Like, you know, you can 
say something that you disagree with. This cracks me up. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. This, this, is, th th this is wonderful. Um, I have a question. Uh, of course, fun is culturally specific. Right. And the culture changes. Now, um, the mindset, the way you see the world, you see something important about the world can change in a second. But neuroplasticity, changing the connections inside the brain takes longer. So if I suddenly see something differently, very quickly, uh, my brain didn't change so quickly. So how is changing the mindset, the worldview, linked to neuroplasticity? And what's the time scale here? It is quick. It can happen very quickly. So if you really like a singer, I'm making this up off the top of my head, it's probably not a good example, and you find that that singer did something really egregious, morally, say, you're not gonna like the sound of that singer's voice anymore. It happens very quickly. So cultural shift takes longer for people to uh, accelerate things through you know, lateral learning. But a switch in the reward value of something can happen almost instantaneously. How does that work? It's amazing that it works, but it, it can. I don't know if any of you have ever had a food that you happen to have a virus at the same time and you got sick and had that food. You never liked that food again or it took a long time. It happens very quickly. It's an amazing mechanism. Now that's not to say that you change your total life values overnight, but your values about individual things and your view of them. Anybody been betrayed by a significant other? Did you go from really liking them to not liking them the next day? Yeah. So it can change quite quickly. Thank you. I love this thing. What is this called? <laughs> Only at a technical school would that not break. Thank you so much. Um, so a lot of your presentation centered on uh, um, being positive uh, and this being clearly linked to the reward mechanism. However, most of the rhetoric around climate change is about fear, is about uh, uh, the cost of inaction is uh, higher than the cost of action. Um, so I was wondering, how does the fear um, mechanism works in, in your, your field? Sure. As many of you know, that's called the valence of something, right? Whether it's positive or negative. There is no doubt that punishment and fear change behavior. We, we all know this, we all, anybody that's had children know this, anybody in education knows this. But by and large, if you look at what is the most effective vehicle, if you compare positive and negative for behavior change, positive works better than negative. That doesn't mean negative doesn't work. It's been one of the problems, the whole, as called in the environmental world, gloom and doom scenarios, that make, it's part of what I think contributes to climate depression, is this sense of helplessness that things are going really badly. And many environmental writers and communicators have focused on the negative in order to motivate people because it can be a powerful motivator. You know, you have children, you want them to have a world to live in and, and you hear that it's all gonna fall apart if you don't, you know, do something. But it can also paralyze and I struggled myself during this journey and in the new roles I've taken on because I don't want to be over-optimistic and I have struggled to, to land someplace that I believe is accurate, best I can, about is it gloom and doom? Do we only have five years? You can read all kinds of things. We only have five years, we only have seven years, we only, you know, before we, if we don't turn things around, it's all gonna. The experts I talk to who who are in this field, and perhaps you're one of them, so I don't mean to say that. Most of them feel that climate change is gonna get worse. It's gonna go maybe to three degrees, three to four degrees. It's gonna really hurt large parts of the world, but we're gonna survive. 
and there are some there's some evidence that we may be speeding things up. There are major problems. In the United States, one of the big problems is we don't have the transmission lines, even if we go to renewable energy, to carry the electricity. At the same time, though, people like some in this room are working on new technical solutions, new energy solutions, new battery storage, all sorts of things, um, using tides, using different kinds of wind turbines, you name it, carbon capture. So, because so many people are working on it at so many levels, I believe that the best consensus is that things are going to get worse, but we're going to pull out of it. We don't know quite the pace. I don't believe it means we must stop fossil fuels tomorrow or we're going to die. We're not going to stop fossil fuels. So, I think that to answer your question, negative can work, but those of us in the scientific community, our job is to be objective and try to get the facts and share the facts with people who are anxious about it and, and find the solutions that are most likely to be highest yield, but also to cast a wide net because this is an uncharted territory. We don't know what's gonna solve the problem. Nothing's gonna solve the problem. My book sure as heck is not gonna solve the problem. It's just another way to look at it. So I think that doom and gloom may motivate some people. It's probably going to resonate with some people. As the overriding strategy, I think it'll backfire because I think it, it paralyzes people with utter fear and um, depression. Does that answer your question? Yes, Um, you talked a lot about like the impact like elders and authority figures can have um, like sort of making you believe something but is there a like neurological or psychological basis where we can have that impact on those authority figures in a way that's not like lobbying a university president but sort of like convincing your family members or something Authority can come in different guises, right? So evolutionarily, our authority figures were our elders or our community leaders. You can be an authority figure to somebody who is older than you or younger than you or plays a different role in society than you do. Authority means you have knowledge and passion and you are convincing. So I don't think authority has to go in the traditional top-down way only, but we are predisposed to believing people we know and trust and who are presented to us as authority figures. Historically, that's our elders, but it's not confined to them. So if you're part of, say, a student group, and you do your homework, and you know about climate change, and you know about what your university is doing, for example, or a company, and you know it's bad, you can be an authority figure. If you know your facts, and you are armed, and you, in fact, are an authority. So yes, I think it can go in both directions. I will tell you that one of the most common reasons that I see people in my age group becoming climate advocates is because their kids are worried about it. They're adult children, and their adult children have taught them, and in some ways pressured them, and they now are totally on board. So information flow and quote-unquote authority can be multi-directional. Good question. So with those very wise words, I'd like to thank Dr. Duhame for an absolutely fascinating, thought-provoking lecture. I also have learned from my adult children, so I can definitely speak to say that there's a lot of truth in what she said. Anybody can be an authority figure if you have the conviction and you have the belief. And I hope that the EPFL students know that, the, uh, that their authority figures are definitely listening to them and definitely believe in the importance of taking action for sustainability. Thank you so much, Dr. Duhame, for your wonderful lecture. And I'd like to invite, to, to thank Dr. Duhame again and welcome everyone to the Apero, which is on the other side, where you'll have possibility to ask Dr. Duhame even more questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great job.